I think we are live. Mm -hmm. Right, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning into this live video. Am, am I here? Am I live? Yep, yep. Imram says hi. Milo says hello. Good, we're on, we're on, we're on, we're on. Good, right, welcome. Um, haven't done a live uh, chat for a while, so I thought it would be a good idea. Um, ask any questions you like. I'm going to get around to whichever ones I can. Um, where I don't know, I'll be saying I don't know. <laughs> and... Uh, where I'm unsure, I'll be saying I'm unsure. So we've got the whole setup. We've got uh, everything we need if we need to draw pictures. There we go. Pen and paper at the ready. Nothing like all the high tech, all the high tech stuff. Now, down to the business. Um, now, Glenn, <clears throat> let me just show you this, some of the... Here we have uh, Glenn, Glenn Smith. Do you think regular flu vaccination has a det detrimental effect on the immune response to COVID-19? Right, Glenn, this is a good question. Now, Glenn's question is saying, um, does the regular flu vaccine have an effect on the outcome of the, the COVID-19 disease? Well, the regular flu vaccine, of course, is to influenza virus. And most years, I think it contains about three different uh, vaccines to three different strains of flu that are estimated that are going to be problematic in the next, in the next season. So what the issue is here, what we don't want, what we don't want is we don't want people to be getting sick with influenza and sick with COVID-19 at the same time, because they're both potentially quite serious viral infections, but different types of viral infections. Now, of course, there's no reason why the body shouldn't be infected with both viruses at the same time. And that's a, that's a bad combination. That's almost certainly associated with a poor prognosis. And we did see some of this at the end of the last influenza season. And I'm concerned that this is going to reoccur at the, uh, the next influenza season as well. Because when we have our next influenza season, and next uh, autumn or fall and next winter, there's still, still going to be COVID-19 around. That is unfortunately for sure. So what is the best thing to do? Well, <clears throat> there has been some um, provisional uh, results that show that the flu vaccine might have an adverse effect on on COVID nineteen, and and this is like a this can be like an enhanced immunological response where the antibodies that are raised to the flu vaccine could have an adverse effect on on the COVID nineteen prognosis. But I haven't read anything definite on that yet. Now I might I might be I'm subject to updating on that. I haven't read anything definite on it. But from what I understand from general principles at the moment, the far bigger risk is that someone becomes infected with influenza virus and gets COVID-19 at the same time. So my strong suspicion is there's going to be a very high uptake of influenza flu vaccination this, this autumn, this fall. And uh, what we're waiting for is the community health uh, officials in various countries to make a decision on this. We don't know what that, that, that decision is going to be yet, but I suspect that decision is going to be whatever you do, make sure you get the flu vaccine so you don't have the flu and COVID-19 at the same time. So I think that's the way it's going to go, but for sure we don't know yet. It's not definitive. <clears throat> right. Um, Lou from... Uh, Lu Lewis, sorry. Um, uh, from Yorkshire. Um, do, do you think the Italian doctor suggesting that the virus is becoming less deadly? Um, do we think the virus is becoming less deadly? Right. Now, what happens with this is a, this is what we call an RNA virus. It's a ribonucleic acid virus. And these viruses are always mutating. They're always changing a little bit. <clears throat> and, and, and that's been useful because that means we can trace what we call phylogenetic trees. This is like an evolutionary tree for the virus. So, for example, the virus that we have in the UK mostly came from Spain and Italy. 
we have like a European strain of the virus. In China, they might have slightly different strains because of these small mutations. But so far, there's no hard evidence that these small mutations have altered the virulence of the virus. And there's no hard evidence that they've altered the pathogenicity of the virus, how sick the virus is going to make you. Because the genetic code for the virus is going to change, it is going to mutate. But there's many proteins in the virus and it would only really matter. Um, the, the, the only time a mutation would matter particularly if it was in the active spikes of the virus. In the active spikes of the virus that adsorb onto the receptor sites in the host cells. That's what would make it particularly dangerous. And as of now, I don't know that there's any evidence for that. So um, the virus is mutating, the virus is changing, but it doesn't seem to have affected how transmissible the virus is significantly or how virulent the virus is in terms of how sick it will make you at the moment. So I think the Italian doctor's suggestion at the moment is not substantiated by the evidence. Now, having said that, the virus could mutate, that's possible. And it's possible that the virus could mutate to make it more infectious and more virulent. Or it's possible, that, as he's suggesting, that the virus could mutate and make it less pathogenic and less virulent, less transmissible. Either of those could happen. But so far, this has not been a fast mutating virus in terms of altering its pathogenicity and its virulence. So I think the answer to that question is basically uh, no at the moment. OK. <clears throat> um, so many questions now. Um, let's pick another one. I can work out how to do this. There we go. Right, watching the beginning, this is uh, Natalie, watching the beginning of the second wave come through here in Florida. The numbers are rising fast. The front line RRT here, what are your thoughts? Now, in the last 24 hours, I've had quite a lot of emails from the United States telling me that the number of infections are increasing dramatically at the moment. So the information I have here now, as of this minute, is that lots of people are telling me, and some are in healthcare, that the number of cases are rising in the United States. And th this is Florida as an example. But I went on to Our World in Data <coughs> site this morning. And the Our World in Data site is not showing a significant increase in the number of new cases per day in the United States. Now, these new cases are based on re the results of testing. So what it seems is there hasn't been an increase in the number of testings. Now, Andrew Como, for example, opened or is opening 15 testing sites in New York where people that have been involved in the recent protests can turn up and be tested. But I've had other emails that have told me that no one's going to go to these centres or very few people are going to go to these centres because they're frightened that their name and address and everything will be recorded and that uh, legal action could be potentially taken against them in the future. So quite how successful that's going to be at the moment, I don't know. Now, I'm on record as saying I expect the cases to dramatically increase in the United States over the next week or two. And whether that's true or not will become evident in the next week or two. The reason I think the cases will likely increase is because of the uh, incredible lack of social distancing during these widespread protests. Now, whenever I say that, I get the counter argument that says, yeah, but a lot of people are wearing masks. But wearing masks is not instead of social distancing. Wearing masks is not instead of hand hygiene. As we looked at yesterday, it's part of a comprehensive strategy to break the transmission of this virus. So wearing masks of the right type is in addition to good hand hygiene, good face to hand hygiene, in addition to social distancing. So the fact that some of the demonstrators or even the majority of demonstrators are wearing masks is not going to stop the transmission of this disease. So I fear that the current demonstrations are going to cause a spike in the number of cases. Now, 
a lot of the people that are demonstrating are young, so they won't die from this. But what, we, what they will do if they become infected as a result of being in close contact with people in the demonstrations, they can take the virus back to vulnerable people. And let me tell you who the vulnerable people are. They are the elderly, so their parents and their grandparents. So if anyone's been demonstrating at these demonstrations, you must assume that you are currently infected and you must self-isolate from older vulnerable people for 14 days. Now, ideally, you will completely self-isolate for 14 days, but I suspect quite a lot of people aren't going to do that. But that would be the ideal. But certainly be careful of people that need guarded, like parents and grandparents. They're going to be more at risk. If you give them the disease, there's a chance that they're going to die. And your parents' and grandparents' chances of dying are much higher than yours. I don't believe you have the right to risk the lives of your parents and grandparents by visiting them. It's that simple. Let me tell you who else is at risk. People with high blood pressure. People with diabetes. People with obesity. People with chronic cardiac conditions such as ischemic heart failure or cardiovascular disease. People with chronic lung diseases. People with chronic asthma. People with obstructive pulmonary disease. And there's a lot of these people in the environment. And also people of African-American origin and Hispanic origin or who have that genetics are also going to be at increased risk of developing severe disease and of dying. So these people need to be protected as much as possible from the effects of this virus or the case fatality rates are going to increase and the, the infection is in the States is going to increase. Now, the big thing about these demonstrations that's good is that they are outside and the virus is diluted outside. So I'm hopeful that my prediction will not come true, but I fear that it will. And a lot of anecdotal evidence, for example, this one from Florida, is starting to indicate that cases are starting to increase already. Now, what will happen is initially there'll be clusters and then there'll be more community spread. So the individual people in the demonstrations will cause clusters that will cause community spread and then it will spread in the community. And often you won't know it's spreading because it's a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic normally for six or seven days, but it can be longer. It can be for 14 days. So we're going to see increasing clusters. Then we'll see increasing cases. We'll see about 15, 20 percent of those people getting really quite ill we'll see 5% of those becoming critically ill. Now, what happens then depends on how much the health services are overwhelmed. Now, again, I've got reports from America that some aspects of the health service are already overwhelmed and people are already struggling to access good quality health care. So we know about 5% of the people that become symptomatic with COVID-19 become critical. With good health care, we can lower the case fatality rate to perhaps 1%. I was just discussing this issue with a friend of mine in India this morning and uh, healthcare is difficult to access there for many people and that could raise the case fatality rate to 2, 3, 4 or even 5%. So I'm afraid that's what we're going to be seeing. Let's hope I'm wrong. But I do expect an increase in cases as a result of the physical proximity. This virus does not respect you or your views. It only tries to propagate its own life cycle by spreading from one mucous membranes to another mucous membrane. Hope that answers that question to some extent. <clears throat> um, right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, um, Okay, let's just go with a random comment here. Do, um, Dr. John, to be honest, I am pretty... I'll put this on. Wrong one. Um, I'm pretty concerned that here in America, the COVID news reports are politically biased. The public is being pulled in many directions. Um, okay. Okay. Um, it, you know, I don't know if that's a question, really. Yes, I think I think that probably is happening. Um, let, let, let's certainly say that the news has shifted quite dramatically away from the COVID-19 pandemic, 
which is causing a lot of deaths in the United States onto other issues which are going on in the United States at the moment. And that, that's, uh, that, that, that's unfortunate. I think people need to stay focused and realise that there is a pandemic going on and realise that lives are still at risk. If politics helps with that, then that's great. Embrace the politics. If politics doesn't help with that, then that is indeed unfortunate because this is a game for uh, people's lives, unfortunately. Uh, right, uh, this is from uh, Rossini. Now, when I put that screen on, th th this was us a few minutes ago, so just ignore that. I'm looking at, the, I'm looking at these questions here. Um, do you think this, the, there's a chance the virus could just fade away? Gosh, I'm hoping so. Best wishes from Dublin, Ireland. Yeah. Um, well, as we've mentioned, the virulence of the virus could change with mutation, but that could change in either direction. It's more likely it will change to be less virulent. But I think the question really is here, what's going to happen over the next year or so? Now, in the UK at the moment, perhaps 5 or 10% of the population have been exposed to uh, the COVID-19 virus. And therefore, <clears throat> we believe probably have some degree of immunity to it. Um, the vaccine is umdenard about, but it's probably not going to happen for some time yet. Not in 2020, I wouldn't have thought. So the only way this is going to stop <laughs> is when we have herd immunity. We need herd immunity. Now, when there's herd immunity, that will probably be 70% or so of people are immune to the virus. Then that means if I've, uh, if, some, if I've got the virus, I'm more likely to bump into someone who is already immune and someone on the other side of them is going to be protected with herd immunity. So I think we're basically waiting for that. So to answer this question, do I think it's just going to fade and go away? The answer is no. I think we've got this virus for at least the next year and until we get an effective vaccine. And as herd immunity builds up, then some areas will have increased immunity. Now, this strategy is actually happening by default in some parts of the world. Um, for example, today in Moscow, they've just released basically all restrictions and people aren't restricted anymore. They can go about their normal daily lives pretty well. And that means there's going to be a lot of spread. A lot of people are going to come, become infected. A lot of people are going to be sick at all at the same time. Quite a lot of people are going to die. But it also means the population will become immune rather quickly. So herd immunity could be present in Russia in the next sort of three, four months' time. But the cost of that, of course, is the proportion of deaths that we suffer from. Or that that particular area uh, suffers from. Uh, stay two metres apart. Do not go in front of someone if they sneeze or cough. Yep, yeah, yeah, okay. Because um, you can be sick immediately. So you need to see a doctor. Okay. Now, the, the, the advice in the UK would be if you think you've been infected, for example, if you've been near an infectious person or... Yeah. I mean, is it if it could go live in the YouTube... I think I'm still... I, I think I'm still live because it's just... It's got end stream up there. Oh. Oh. Now it's come back saying one moment, please. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's because that's on that screen there. Uh, I'm back. Yeah. We are back. Um, that was my computer crashing and I have no idea why. So um, sorry about that. Thank you for the uh, 1,100 odd people that <laughs> had the patience to remain with us. I'm just talking to my techie there and he's uh, going to look into it. I'm not quite sure why that happened, but thank you for coming back. Now, what was I talking about? I actually forgot. Was I talking about herd immunity? Anyway, we'll go on to something. Sorry, my mind went on to technical issues there. Right. Right. Uh, Patricia Morgan. Uh, Patricia um, is asking, what are your thoughts about reservoir species, virus circulating into other species? Okay, so this coronavirus, as we know, came from animals. It probably came from bats. 
and it probably came from some other animal. Now, whether so we know this is what we call a zoonotic virus. That's what the uh, the geneticists are telling us. It's a zoonotic virus. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the virus didn't come from a lab because we know in Wuhan, the laboratory there, the Institute of Virology, was doing virological uh, experiments. And it could have been that an animal was sold by a corrupt worker from that facility. And that's how the virus got out. That's one possibility. Or it could have been that it was a genuinely wild zoonotic transfer, perhaps through one of these markets where they sell and uh, kill wild animals in China. Um, so it could have been either of those. So we know the virus can come from animals. There was a mutation that allowed that. And there was a mutation that allowed it to spread from person to person. But we also know that this virus has gone back from humans into cats and a few cases, although it seems to be harder, into dogs. And we do know that it can infect hamsters because we've looked at some hamster experiments. And we now know that it can infect mink because of the cull of mink that's going on. Perhaps up to four million mink are going to be potentially uh, killed in the Netherlands to stop it. So, yes, it is possible that this could go back into an animal reservoir. Having said that, it's probably less likely to be a wild animal reservoir and more likely to be a domestic animal reservoir, such as mink. But it is possible. And I think the other thing that's worth saying is, and um, if we don't change the way that we interact with wildlife and with animals, such as capturing wild animals and selling them for meat, um, if we don't change this interaction then there's going to be more of these what we call spillover events. So when a virus, an animal virus, goes from an animal into humans, we call that a spillover event. And there's going to be more of these if we keep coming on in contact with viruses. Because in the wild, there are untold billions and trillions of different types of virus. Viral particles are absolutely everywhere on the surface of the Earth. Now, they're a bit of a mystery to me, but I mean, there's way, way more viruses than there are types of bacteria, for example. Now, I don't know how they got there and I don't know what most of them do, but they do play a vital role in ecosystems. So they are a necessary part of ecosystems. But the point is they should be where they are in an animal or in a wood and not in us. Uh, that would be the ideal situation. Now, with this particular COVID-19 virus, I think between you and me, we have been extraordinarily lucky because this could have been a virus which was as transmissible, for example, as measles and as deadly as, for example, um, Middle East respiratory syndrome or Ebola. It could have been that bad. So we're lucky that we haven't got a virus which is more transmissible than this. The virus is only as transmissible as it is. And the virus is only as deadly as it is because we could have had one that was much more transmissible and much more deadly. So if we've learned from this virus, if we've learned that um, we, we need to prevent this spillover type of infection, that would be good. I hope you can hear me OK. I know there's a bit of noise outside. This is the trouble with my studio. It's not soundproof. <laughs> right. Um, so that would be my thoughts on reservoir species. Right. Why are so many of our elderly loved ones here in the UK dying in care homes when they can't get treatment rather than in hospital where they could? That's from uh, A. Um, hmm. I don't know how true that is. I think people that are poorly, I mean, certainly on, on accidents and emergency, we get people in from care homes all the time. It's a pretty routine thing. So I'm not sure how entirely true that is. Um, so people do get treatment when they need it. And having said that, the care in many care homes is good. So I don't know how true that is. It, if, if it was the case, it, it would be concerning. But from my experience working on A&E departments, uh, if, if care home staff are anxious about residents, they, they will send them in. 
uh, nearly always in fact so I'm, I'm not sure that people are dying in care homes through lack of medical treatment in the UK I'm pleased to say right Ross Ross Greening uh, so why is vitamin D not being pushed higher up the agenda there is so much evidence for it now as soon as I started typing I froze not sure what the last bit means but never mind. oh I, I oh, sorry my picture froze right okay right apologies for that um, yeah here we are right um, now the, the evidence to my, my mind that vitamin D is necessary to for the normal functioning of the immune system is simply overwhelming now the, the background to this is that most forms of malnutrition can result in immunodeficiency for example you need a certain amount of vitamin c you need a certain amount of zinc you need a certain amount of uh, protein to have normal immunity and if you don't have these nutrients then the immune system will not be working as well as normal so nutritional deficiency can lead to immunodeficiency but thankfully for most of us the foods that we need contain the foods that we have access to give us the nutrients that we need but the nutrient that is different is vitamin d because only about 10 percent of the vitamin d that we use actually comes from our food the other 90 percent is produced in the skin as a result of exposure to ultraviolet radiation and because many of us live inside a lot of the time and because um, of our occupations and b because we wear clothes and because a lot of us live in, in northern areas where it's uh, not very sunny, we don't get much sun exposure. So we have a lack of sun exposure. And that means that many of us are short of vitamin D. And that means that the immune system is not getting the vitamin D it requires. Now, if you, if you, take, if you take way more vitamin D than you need you take excess amounts of vitamin d that's not going to improve the immune system further there's a limit to how good it's going to get but if you're short of vitamin d then if you're short of vitamin d that is going to reduce the efficiency of the immune system and as i understand the science this is this is well known and this is this is established science that we we, we, we know this um, so why this is not promoted more strongly in in the public agenda why SAGE never seemed to mention it, why government briefings never seemed to mention it, is just a mystery to me. Now, the Irish government and the French government have published on this. But a lot of people write into me and say, well, you know, there's no money in vitamin D because we can make tons of vitamin D very cheaply. It's very easy to make. Now, the prices of vitamin D have gone up, but that's people profiteering. It's actually dirt cheap to make. We can make tons of it. We can make tons and tons of high potency vitamin D without really any difficulty at all. So um, th there's two options here. I either it's um, people just haven't looked at it enough or um, there is a conspiracy going on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it does seem strange that something so readily available, so cheap, is not known about. And uh, I know people have written to me and we've had a question asked in the House of Lords in the UK about this. But again, nothing feeds through into official guidelines. And of course, it's a known fact that I think it was 42% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. But if you are African-American, that goes up to, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's over 80% and Hispanics it's about 70 odd percent. So the darker the color of the skin, the greater the deficiency of vitamin D. And of course, these are the people that are having the greatest comorbidities as, as a result of uh, COVID-19 and where the death rate is highest. So it really seems that vitamin D is a great blind spot that people just don't seem to be paying attention to. And I really can't explain it. So get onto your politicians and say, oi, you know, write them a letter and say, look, there's evidence that vitamin D deficiency is common. There is evidence that lack of vitamin D can lead to immunosuppression. Why aren't we advocating more vitamin D? It just seems very, very strange because it costs nothing. It's a variable we could eliminate. And for some strange reason, we are not doing it. I think part of the reason is it would indicate that there are biological differences between people with different skin colors. And that goes against the current politically correct zeitgeist to, to identify that. 
in the meantime uh, greater numbers of people with darker colored skin are, are dying which of course is a complete tragedy whenever people die when they don't need to I, I've been in, in many situations of course where, where people are dying and in the vast majority of those and quite a few times I've, I've had to tell relatives that, that, that their loved one has died it's a difficult thing to do but um, what I've usually been able to say is but we did everything we could everything that could have been done was done now I've been in situations where that's not the case and, and uh, they, they're the situations that kind of live with you um, some sad situations where I didn't have the facilities to save people's lives or, or to help people that, that that's a different situation but mo most of the time I was able to say well we did everything we could and right now I do not believe we're doing everything we can because we've got this glaring variable of lack of vitamin D and uh, we just do not seem to be addressing it so people are dying and I think we have to say as a society we have not done everything we can because we haven't corrected their vitamin D levels so thank you for that question Ros um, how do you this is this is uh, Indiana Indiana Dawn um, how do you define asymptomatic in terms of asymptomatic for SARS coronavirus 2 okay so if someone is symptomatic that simply means they have symptoms um, is that better yep so if, if someone's symptomatic that simply means they have symptoms and if they are asymptomatic that simply means they do not have symptoms so a is a medical prefix and it simply means with without so whenever you say whenever you see a or an in front of a word that means without so for example if someone is anuric that means they're not producing uh, uh, any urine for example so a or an mean without so someone who's asymptomatic will have the infection in my view will be transmissious tra transmiss transmitting the infection to other people although there is debate about that but I think they are transmitting the infection to other people but they will not feel sick they will not be complaining of symptoms they are asymptomatic and as well as that with this infection people can be pre-symptomatic that means they can be having the infection they can be uh, developing the infection they can be transmitting the infection but they haven't yet started to develop symptoms they are pre-symptomatic they have not yet started to develop it so that's what asymptomatic means um, right uh, Roger I'm not screening these questions I'm just taking random ones so I'm just trying to get through a few random questions John please explain why deaths per 100,000 population in Russia is four and in the UK it's 61 try not to be derogatory about Russian healthcare which is obviously far better than the NHS Roger I disagree with you I do not think that healthcare in the Soviet Union as was which is now well no, forget that forget I said Soviet Union I'm just giving away my age I do not believe healthcare in the uh, in in Russia is as good as healthcare in the United States I think you're simply wrong so I think part of the reason that more people are dying is that the healthcare in the so in Russia is is not as good uh, that the healthcare in the UK is relatively good there's always room for improvement and I also believe that there's not full reporting in Russia as well so um, I, I don't agree with the premise of your question I'm sorry Roger uh right i'm not being derogatory towards russia or any country it's simply a statement of fact there are challenges significant challenges in the health service in russia There's, there are challenges everywhere but there's particular challenges in russia that i believe compared to for example the united kingdom or germany for example Right, Steve comments. Um, he's just watching the crowds on London and stunned into a still silence. Yep, I agree. I am uh, stunned that there are crowds in the middle of a pandemic. 
it's going to cause spread. We've talked about the probability of spread and why spread is less likely to occur, but uh, these people need to find an alternative way to protest. Um, I believe people will die as a result of these mass gatherings. Now, whenever I make a political point, I get told off, so I'm not. But my scientific view is that as a result of these mass gatherings, more people are going to die. That's, that's all I'm saying about that. It's a very unfortunate time for it to be happen, happening. Right, uh, Warren is asking, uh, transplant patients on immunosuppressive drugs, advice apart from shielding. Okay. Now, the background here is that if people have like a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or a lung transplant, the, the, the recipient's body will recognise that as foreign protein and mount an immunological response to reject it, and that's called rejection. So to stop that happening, we have to give these patients immunosuppressing drugs um, <clears throat> for the rest of their lives. They need to be on immunosuppression. And the trouble is the immunosuppression is good because it will stop them rejecting the organ, but it's bad in that it will reduce the efficiency of their immune system altogether, which means that they are much more likely to get COVID-19 infection and much more likely to get um, severe disease and more likely to uh, potentially die from that infection. So these people need to be shielded. They need to be at home alone and they need to be shielded. And uh, the quality of that shielding needs to be good, otherwise their lives are at risk. Uh, now, what advice apart from shielding? Um, stay as healthy as you can. Talk to your doctor and your consultant to make sure that you are on the correct dose of the immunosuppressing therapy that they prescribe for you. Make sure you're taking those correctly, <laughs> that you're not taking more than you needed to take. But make sure you're following their instructions to make sure you're taking the right amount. Uh, make sure you're well nourished. Um, I would say talk to your doctor about vitamin D supplement if you're not getting enough sun. Go out and get some sunbathing uh, without burning, of course. And if, um, if you've got any comorbidities, make sure they are well managed. So, for example, if you have high blood pressure, make sure that's well managed. If you have diabetes, make sure that is well managed but the main thing is to shield stop yourself getting the infection and uh wait wait for the vaccine it's not it, it's not it's not a there's no there's no panacea unfortunately for for people in this difficult situation of increased vulnerability um okay uh marion uh, lots of people uh, here in Egypt were sick in December and January with the exact same COVID symptoms. Uh, do you think it was around much earlier than official reported? So December, January. This is an interesting question. Now, I've just started reading some reports from American Intelligence who have been analysing satellite imaging over Wuhan. And they found that the hospitals in Wuhan seem, seem to be much busier than normal late 2019. Now, I haven't delved into that data fully yet, but it could well be that the virus was circulating autumn in Wuhan. And given that there's a lot of people travel from China into Africa, then the answer to your question is, do you think it was around much earlier than officially reported? The answer to your question is yes, I think it probably was around much earlier than reported. And I've, I've had quite a few videos and um, other comments in from people who are just absolutely convinced they had this disease, December, January, February. Now, we all know this with a much greater degree of certainty when we get comprehensive antibody testing and we see everyone who's been exposed to this disease as yet we don't have that but the data does seem to be emerging and, and in fact um, 
more and more data, as more and more data comes out, for example, samples have been looked at from people in parts of the United States and in parts of the United Kingdom that were taken much earlier, sort of January time, February time, and they've turned out to be positive. So um, I think when we know more about this pandemic, yes, we will find out that the virus was with us earlier than we had thought. Quite how early, don't really have the data to answer. Could there have been quite a few cases in Egypt in January? Yes. December, if this, if it turns out that the virus was circulating in Wuhan in September, October, then yes, December is not ludicrous. That is quite possible. So if you think you've had it, do try and work out a way to get the antibody test. And that will tell you whether you've had it or not. So good question, Martin. Don't know, but I think so is the answer. Um, right. Someone's saying they can't hear me. Can you hear me? Hopefully you can hear me. Someone says I can't see your shoes, so I guess you can hear me. Right. Um, right. Jericho is asking, if the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine proves effective in August, how long would it take from there for things to return mostly back to normal? Uh, that's uh, Jericho asking that question. Right, now, I think what I announced yesterday in yesterday's video was that the Oxford AstraZeneca team are going to be making an announcement in August as to whether their vaccine works or not. The data will be in as to whether this virus is efficacious, whether it actually works. The vaccine project is not going to be finished by August. That is not possible. Um, having said that, um, AstraZeneca has geared up to produce two billion doses of the vaccine quickly. And there are commitments to get this to uh, people that uh, need it in fairly short order around the world. That they have, In other words, the manufacturing capacity is ready already uh, before the scientists have finished their job. Um, now, if it is confirmed that it works in August, they're going to have to be further clinical trials. But it is possible if that vaccine works, and it is still an if, that it could be doses of that could be available in 2020. Now, once the vaccine's rolled out and people have had two doses and 70 or 80 percent of the population are immune, then things will go back to normal. So if everything goes perfectly with it, perfectly with this Oxford vaccine, the trials are there, the manufacturing goes on perfectly then life could be back to normal as a result of this vaccine in early 2020, uh, maybe January uh, 20, uh, 2021, but, but by, by next January or February. But that is the most possible optimistic interpretation of that. Realistically, I don't think we're going to be giving out large amounts of this vaccine or, or another vaccine until the summer of 2021. So basically, I think we've got another year before things are fully back to normal. Let's hope it is earlier than that. But um, even if this vaccine does roll out next summer, it's going to be incredibly quick. It's going to be the world record by a long margin, by a long, big margin. Normally, it takes years and decades to make vaccines. Okay. Okay, uh, Robbie. Um, Robbie's asking, um, if masks have been worn from the start, but no lockdown imposed, would we be worse off? Okay, so what Robbie's saying is, what is most effective? Locking down? or wearing masks? Uh, well, 
The answer is, in my view, that both are effective. Now, if we imagine a hypothetical, hypothetical situation, as your question suggests, where there was no lockdown measures, but everyone wore masks, would we be worse off or better off than we are now? Um, that is a good question. The answer's probably... <laughs> I don't know. I can't answer that question. Um, but, but if we had worn masks fr from the beginning, then we would be... Uh, spread would have been a lot slower than it was if we'd worn masks from the beginning, in my view. Um, part of the reason I'm saying that is the theory we now have on how masks are efficacious, but also the countries that wore masks comprehensively, such as Thailand, Cambodia, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, China, they, they've done significantly better than we have. And I believe that wearing masks is a significant factor in that. So the lockdown was necessary. The lockdowns probably saved a few million lives in Europe, but wearing masks would have been even better if we'd done that as well from the beginning. Good to see that masks are being worn in many places now. As far as I know, it's going to be mandated on public transport in the UK from, I think, the 15th of June. So uh, it's uh, a few days away yet, but it can't come soon enough. So... I think I think the answer the answer is uh, Robbie that wearing masks is part of a comprehensive strategy. It's not an and or. It's not an instead of. It's uh, it's part of a comprehensive strategy. Please, people are showing up to work sick. Francesca, right, saying people are turning up to work sick. Now, if you think you are symptomatic for COVID-19, it is absolutely essential that you immediately self-isolate because when you first develop symptoms, for the first couple of days after you develop symptoms, that is when you are most infectious. So you are going to be infectious for two or three days before you develop symptoms but you are shedding the highest number of the viral particles the first, second and third day that you feel ill. That's when you are most infectious. So that's the time when it's most important to isolate, the time when it's most important not to go into work. Now, after that, you can still be infectious for another four or five days. So you can be infectious for about seven days, seven or eight days after symptoms develop. And indeed, if symptoms... Um, <clears throat> If symptoms persist, then you can be infectious for longer than that. But you are most infectious in the first few days. So as soon as you start feeling sick, you need to go home. You need to self-isolate and, if possible, organise a test. And do not break your self-isolation until the 14 days have passed and you are not feeling ill. Or you have a negative test or you get ill and start feeling better after seven days, only then should you start going out again. So going in public and going to work when you're actively sick is the worst thing you can do. You should absolutely not do that. In fact, I mentioned this uh, recently. There was a poll, I can't remember his name now, but there was a politician in Parliament who was giving a speech and he was obviously sick. Now, we hope he just became sick at the time, but if someone, had, if he'd felt sick before, then that would have been really dangerous because if it was the first day he started feeling sick, that's the day he would be most infectious and could be spreading the virus to a lot of other people. So if you feel sick, do self-isolate until you have had a negative test or until uh, the 14 days has elapsed. Right, uh, sorry, where are we? No, we're on the second screen there, aren't we? Right, uh, Ryan, is every death from pneumonia analysed to identify the exact underlying infection? At one point, should doctors have started looking for a novel cause at the start of the pandemic? Okay, um, Right, if you're admitted, for example, to uh, an A&E department and you have pneumonia, well, pneumonia is not too difficult to diagnose clinically. 
So pneumonia is infection right in the uh, alveoli in the lungs, uh, right down in the lungs. That that would be um, that would be pneumonia, and people with that are often very sick. Uh, they're likely to have a fever. They're likely to have a high heart rate. Uh, they're likely to be breathing quickly. They're tachycardic and tachypneic. And when we do their blood tests, they're, they're likely to be abnormal as well. And then when we do a chest X-ray, it's relatively easy usually to see pneumonia on, on an X-ray. So pneumonia is actually a really common condition in, in accident and emergency departments. And it's relatively straightforward, usually, usually relatively straightforward to diagnose. Now, this is actually what happened back in Wuhan. Dr. Lee said, just a minute, we're getting lots of cases of atypical pneumonia here. So it's not pneumonia caused by the normal bacteria, such as the pneumococcus, which is the most common cause of pneumonia, the streptococcus pneumoniae, or other common causes of pneumonia. It was a novel viral pneumonia. So that's how they first recognised that this was a novel virus. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Now, the, the other thing about, about pneumonia is when people get viral pneumonia, which is what we're talking about here, this is a viral pneumonia, then there's a greater risk that they will get secondary bacterial infection. So if you've got a viral pneumonia in there, then there's going to be inflammation. Your lungs aren't going to be working properly. You're still exposed to bacteria and you can get bacterial secondary infection. And in that case, your life can be saved by giving antibiotics. And normally in hospital, we would give intravenous antibiotics for that. And in fact, in the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic that killed between 50 and 100 million people, that's between 50 and 100 million people died in 1918-1919 from the flu. Um, a lot of those people, or a significant proportion of those people, didn't die from the influenza virus, the H1N virus itself. What they actually died from was secondary bacterial infection. And of course, we live in the antibiotic generation, but you've got to remember that antibiotics only started in the Second World War. Uh, first antibiotics came in about 1942, and antibiotics weren't available to the general public uh, readily until the late 40s, early 50s. So antibiotics are really quite a recent thing. Um, we, we kind of take them for granted now, but they're actually quite a recent invention. So bacterial pneumonia is, is a real risk, and that's why we have to be careful for secondary infection. And hospitalised patients will often be given antibiotics to prevent this very real possibility of uh, secondary bacterial pneumonia. So is every death from pneumonia analysed? Yeah, I think you can basically say it is. As soon as, soon as someone comes in with a pneumonia, what we do, we take blood out of their arm and we send it off for what you call blood, blood cultures. So you, put, you, you have two blood bottles and you put blood from the patient's arm directly into both of these bottles. One bottle tests for aerobic bacteria, one bottle tests for anaerobic bacteria. If that's negative, you would then start thinking about atypical infection or you would start thinking about viral infection. So, so yes, diagnosing the etiological organism in pneumonia is absolutely standard practice. But of course, if you're in an area where healthcare is not available, um, then that wouldn't be done if you're in a poorer area. So it depends where you are. Um, right. Uh, Angus. <clears throat> Do you know if a vaccine for COVID-19 would protect us against future mutations? Like the way the Spanish flu mutated in the second, third wave. Okay, that's a good question. So um, influenza is a rapid mutator. That's why we have to keep um, working out different vaccines. Well, not me, it's clever people. Like the Centre for Disease Control keep working this out every year. Um, now, the amount of mutation that there's been, as we've said already on this talk, in COVID-19 has affected areas of the COVID-19 virus, but it's not really affecting the, the spikes, the bit that actually do the infecting. It's not really affecting those at the moment. And of course, the people that are developing the vaccines are very clever 
and they know how this virus is likely to mutate and they know the way it has mutated. So they are very careful to pick parts of the virus for their vaccine, which generates your antibodies to work against. So they deliberately target the vaccine to work against a part of the virus which is not likely to mutate. So they're very aware of this. So the bottom line to that question is, I am very optimistic that one vaccine, once we have it, will work for all viral strains in the world because the virus has not mutated that significantly so far. So I think, I think a vaccine for COVID-19 would protect against all current mutations. Now you ask about future mutations, of course, we don't know the future. But it's probable that for this particular type of COVID-19 that that vaccine will give at least a degree of immunity for some years, if not decades to come. Yes, I would expect that to be the case. Right. <clears throat> What are your thoughts on long haulers that seem to have symptoms for three to four months and not yet recovered? Yeah, um, that's from uh, Kerry. So some people who get this virus and become symptomatic have a very mild illness and are better within about 24 hours. Other people are quite sick for a much longer period of time and other people are sick and, and, and start deteriorating in the second week. Now, the reason people deteriorate sometimes in the second week is because of this abnormal inflammatory reaction, sometimes called the cytokine storm, that can give rise to acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a cause of death. But apart from that, there does seem to be a subset of people, fortunately a minority, that just seem to be sick for ages with this virus. And, and that does happen. People clear the virus at very much different rates. So yes, it is possible that people can be sick for much, much longer than the average. That is certainly possible and there are documented cases of it. Okay, Anne. There's a recent report that the Centre for Disease Control is saying that pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic spread of COVID is rare or very rare. Do you think this is a reason to decrease our precautions? Now, I've been following this quite closely from January, and there's been different reports on this saying that people with pre-symptomatic infections are less infectious than people with actual infections. And there is truth in that because people are most infectious in the first days after they develop symptoms. But there is still evidence that people have shed the virus before they develop symptoms, therefore can be symptomatic. So my understanding of the evidence as it currently is, is that people can spread the disease before they're symptomatic and when they are asymptomatic. Now, are they spreading the disease as much as people that are acutely sick? No, they're not, because people are most infectious in the first few days of their illness. But can they still spread the infection? Well, yes, there's many document ca documented cases that they can. So if official bodies are saying that the risk of infection is less from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, um, I think they might say it's rare, but it can certainly occur. So no, I don't think that's a reason to change our precautions. I think the precautions we have at the moment, we know have worked in many areas like Taiwan, for example. And we should carry on with them as they are. So I think what we're talking about is a degree of risk. So pre-symptomatics and asymptomatics might be less infectious than symptomatics, but in my view are still symptomatic. And I don't actually think statements from official bodies saying that pre-symptomatics and asymptomatics don't spread the virus significantly are actually quite helpful because we believe that they do. And we do need to carry on taking the precautions. Right. Uh, this is a question from uh, Malika. Um, hi, John. Have you seen the mass campaigns in Malawi two weeks ago? Still, 
huge crowds totally disregarding COVID, life as normal, no serious consequences yet, what's going on? Right. So I, I'm not familiar with these um, mass campaigns or demonstrations or whatever they were in Malawi two weeks ago. Um, but if cases haven't increased, then that's good. Now, we have expressed concerns about African countries many times on these videos. Now, Malawi, like quite a few African countries, is the older people there have already died uh, before they got old. So the average demographic in a lot of these African countries, such as Malawi, is fairly young. So if the average age of the population is 22, then we know that 22-year-olds are at much less risk from getting a COVID-19 severe disease than 82-year-olds. So we're hoping that a lot of these poorer countries are going to be less affected because of the younger demographic that they have. But kind of the other way of looking at this is, isn't it sad that so many people haven't made it into middle age and old age in those countries because they've already died? So the reason the demographic is young is because a lot of old people have died already and many, many of these people, of course, died from HIV infection. Now, going against countries like Malawi is pre-existing disease like malaria, uh, dengue fever, uh, chest infections, diarrhea and vomiting. All of these things are going to increase the risk of spread and increase the severity. Um, what's going for people in places like Malawi, of course, is it's very sunny. And quite a lot of people work outside, so they'll make vitamin D. Now, the people in Malawi have very dark coloured skin relatively dark well certainly compared to me they've got dark color skin so they'll make the vitamin d more slowly but of course it's also very sunny so if they're working outside then presumably they're making quite good levels of vitamin d which i believe is going to be protective now the other thing is the world health organization is saying that this virus is not seasonal and yet and, and there are hot countries where, where there have been cases of course but um the degree to which tropical temperatures are going to protect us from the environment from the virus is basically we've still got more to learn on that yet so um and of course life as normal no serious consequences as yet but what i would say malik was how do you know there's no serious consequences because if there's very limited testing as there is in malawi then people could be getting sick and people could potentially be dying uh, especially in rural areas and that's never officially registered that's never officially communicated so let's hope the the, the uh, underpinning of your question is correct that less is going on but uh, we're not sure whether that's the case or not yet but let's hope you're right okay melissa uh where have you gone Where's Melissa going? Anyway, Melissa's question was about blood groups. Completely lost my place now. It's your fault, Melissa. Right. Anyway, let, let, let's deal with the question. Um, so Melissa's asking about blood groups. Now, there has been some reports uh, from China and a couple other places now, I think. <clears throat> um, but I haven't seen it published in the peer-reviewed li literature yet. Where have I gone? There we go. Um, <clears throat> that people with blood group A are more prone to getting severe disease and people with blood group O are less prone to getting severe disease. Now, I don't think this is making any comment on how likely you are to get the disease in the first place. I don't think it's commenting on that. Um, but it's saying that people with blood group A, when they get the disease, are more likely to get severe disease and complications and presumably die. People with blood group O are less likely to get it. Now, there's various possibilities here. One is that this is a real effect and that blood group is somehow influencing how pathogenic how how sick this virus makes you that's one possibility can't see why that should be the case 
The other possibility is that the gene that controls blood group is very close to a gene that controls part of the immune system on the chromosome. And if two genes are close together on the chromosome, then they're often co-inherited. So every time, not every time, but virtually every time you get the, blood, the, the gene for blood group uh, O, you get the, the gene next to it on the chromosome carries a, an immunoprotective gene, and that normally goes with it. This is called co-inheritance. So I think that's probably more likely to be the explanation that there's some co-inheritance going on here because it makes perfect sense that some people should be genetically more prone to the virus and some people genetically less prone to the virus. I can't see why blood groups would make any difference. Blood group is just the antigen on the surface of the red cells. That's all blood groups are in terms of ABO systems, recess systems. So I don't think it's the blood group itself. Could it be a gene which is close to the blood group gene on the chromosome? Yes, that's quite possible. Because, of course, the blood group you are is entirely genetically determined. So I think it could be some sort of co-inheritance of an immunologically active gene. That's my current theory. Having said that, um, the studies that are showing that people with blood group A get more disease, more severe disease than people with blood group O get less severe disease are just observational studies. And the quality of that data is not yet high and uh, I've yet to see it in, in a proper peer-reviewed uh, publication. But if it does, does turn out to be the case, I suspect co-inheritance is probably going to be the answer. So, good question. A lot of these are comments rather than questions. Uh, Marling talk. I'm just wondering if, uh, here we are. Mailing is from Scandinavia somewhere. Um, Oh, is it Stephen? No, Stephen. Stephen Gilbert. Stephen here. So I think it's Stephen. Uh, how do you suggest Inuits were able to get their vitamin D if they're not able to eat fish, seal or whale animal meat? OK, that's a very legitimate question. Now, Inuit, of course, are people that live up in the frozen north, that they are indigenous uh, Americans. Uh, they've been there for 16,000 years or so. Um, and traditionally their diet has been fish and uh, I think they eat seals as well fish and seals um, now the thing about fish is the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the fish livers concentrate the, uh, the fat soluble vitamins just the same as your liver does just as any animal you store fat soluble vitamins in your liver and the fat soluble vitamins are ADEC, A, D, E, and K. A, D, E, K are the fat soluble vitamins. So that obviously includes D. So in the traditional diet, um, well, let's think about let's think about seals, for example. So seals eat fish, and of course they eat the fish's livers, and that uh, they concentrate. This is called bioamplification or bioconcentration. So the vitamin the vitamins become even more concentrated in the seal because the seal the seals eat in the fish. And then if people eat the seals, they get an even higher proportion of the fat soluble vitamins from their diet. So the answer is in the traditional diet, um, Inuit would get enough vitamin D from their diet. Now I get about 10% of my vitamin D from my diet, 90% from the sun. Well, it's not quite, I don't quite get that because I take supplements. But if you ignore the fact that we take supplements sometimes. But the traditional Inuit diet would have sufficient vitamin D from eating uh, things like seals and eating fish livers. Eating seals, especially when it was already concentrated. So the traditional diet would have sufficient vitamin D to give immunity, even though they don't get, don't get exposed to the sun. They would get it all from their diet. Now, when Inuit and other indigenous groupings 
change from their traditional lifestyles and move into a uh, so they change away from their hunter gatherer lifestyles and th and they move into a lifestyle where they live in a warm house and they can buy biscuits from the shop and they can buy cans of beer and they can buy cakes then they suffer from it's generally true to say that they suffer from diseases of western civilization more so than people who have lived there for thousands of years so uh, aborigines in australia for example are very prone to diabetes and high blood pressure and other health problems as indeed are uh, indian america um, uh, first nation indian groupings in the, in the states and inuit in, in canada for example um so so the answer to your question is well they do suffer a lot from these things i think that's the answer that they, they do they do have a lot of comorbidities which are associated with vitamin D deficiency or some of which are correlated with vitamin D deficiency when they move away from their traditional diet into a westernized diet. So, so the, un the, ans the answer, Stephen, is um, um, th th they do have deficiencies and they do have diseases, I believe, that uh, occur as a result of that because they've moved away from their traditional diet. Um, uh, Wanda Wanda's asking could this virus have existed several years ago in a less dangerous form and possibly mutated into the state it is now uh, is it possible is that a possible right okay uh, I think I've got the question um, y yes, this virus has presumably been around for millions of years, presumably. Um, how long a virus has been around? No one's quite sure because no one's quite sure where they came from. But the, 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 the coronaviruses have been around for a long time. Um, I, I will be sure they've been around for as long as they've been complex animals, uh, complex vertebrates, for example. Um, now... Has it mutated? Well, the answer is yes, it, of course it has, because that's how it got from animals to humans. So there's a mutation that allowed for the spillover to allow the, to allow the, the, the host to change. And then there was probably a further mutation which allowed spread from humans to humans. So um, could, could the virus have existed for several years in a less dangerous form? Yes, absolutely, I wonder it could. And... Uh, has it mutated into the form it is now? Yes, it has mutated into the form it is now. Uh, so your supposition, I believe, is right there on two counts. Well worked out. Um, oh, with the flu vaccine, oh, uh, this is Aileen. With the flu vaccine, does every country do its own research and come up with its own unique vaccine or do countries collaborate i am pretty sure that the flu vaccine comes from the i think the center for disease control in the united states has got a lot to do with this and i'm pretty sure that the the vaccine that is used in the states is the same as the vaccine that's used in the uk is the same as the vaccine that's used in australia so my understanding is that yes absolutely there's like one flu one flu vaccine for the world per year that is my understanding of that now if individual countries make their own i don't know about it i'm happy to be corrected on that but my understanding is it's the same because very often of course the flu follows the season so often the flu will start in australia and then we'll get that strain of flu three or four months later in the uk so yeah i'm pretty well sure it's the same it's the same vaccine that's used all around the world um, that is a good um that's a good question Right, Gwen, furnaces, air, fans in work. Okay. So Gwen uh, Ferraro is asking about circulating air currents. Now, the likelihood that you get infected with this virus depends in part on how many viruses get into your mucous membranes. And perhaps how sick you get depends on how many viruses get into your mucous membranes so uh, that does seem to be a big part of it and if you're outside the virus is going to be diluted which of course is is a good thing now if you're working outside your chances of getting infectious infected are less than if you're inside if you're inside with the window shut 
then your chances of getting infected from someone nearby are going to increase because if the windows are shut and you haven't got a breeze blowing through, the virus that the sick person is giving out are going to be concentrated in the air and there's going to be more of that virus there in the air. So the better the ventilation, the less likely you are to get it. This is one reason that there's so many uh, cases of influenza and colds in winter because people huddle together inside and the viruses are concentrated in an indoor environment. So yes, uh, opening the window, having fans as long as you're blowing infected viral, uh, as long as you're in, uh, blowing air infected with the viral particles out of the window is a good thing. And in Thailand, they did switch off the air conditioning in many places. So they must have thought that the air conditioning was a factor. Now, whether air conditioning is a factor or not depends on if it's circulating from one room to the other and the quality of the filters. If you've got a small air conditioning unit at home, which is taking air from outside and then putting it through the air conditioning unit, normally fixed into the wall and then straight into the room, that's no risk. But circulating air from one workspace to another workspace is certainly a potential risk as the concentration of the virus will be uh, increased, which of course is exactly what we don't want. Okay, so that's about an hour and 20 minutes. We'll, we'll maybe do another 10 minutes or so. There's still a few people watching. Thank you if you're still there. Uh... Okay. Let's have a look through some questions together, see what we can find. Uh, Ali, Ali here. Uh, uh, Ali's question, can you see that? We take nasopharyngeal swabs from dead bodies. How much time after death will be available? That's a good question. So what uh, what Ali is saying there is how long after someone has died will someone still be infectious? Now, I've actually had this conversation with uh, undertakers to, to, to discuss this very issue. Now, the virus will live in the mucus inside a living person's lungs until it's coughed out. And um, it can also live for some period of time after it's been secreted in the lungs of a, of a dead person as well. So someone who is, has died of COVID-19 will be infectious potentially for some time after their death if you came into contact with their um, with their mucus. Quite how long that is, you know, I really don't know. What I would say though, and this is an important conversation I've had with uh, undertakers, is if someone is in a room in a hospital or at home, suppose someone's dying at home and someone's infected with COVID-19, then the infected person, because they're sick, they will be breathing out and coughing out high concentrations of the virus. So if someone has just died in a room, say at half an hour ago, then there will still be a huge amount of the viral particles still in the air, suspended in the air. Now, how many will depend on the ventilation? If the window's open, it's going to be less. But the virus will still be in the air. So someone walking into the room, say 20 minutes after someone's died, could become infected from the virus that is still in the air. And of course, the sick person is going to be exhaling virus onto their clothes and onto the bedclothes. And the virus can survive on fabrics for uh, 24 hours. So they could be infected for 24 hours. Or if there's hard surfaces next to the bed, for example, like a bedside table or a shelf, then the virus can survive on there for three days. So the room where someone has died is going to be infectious potentially for days even even after that person has died. So the infection is going to surround the person that's died of COVID-19. But how long the virus actually remains viable in the lungs of someone that dies, it's going to depend partly on the temperature. 
Um, if they cool quickly, the virus would last for longer. If they're in a warmer environment, the virus will probably die quicker. Um, but my, my guess would be... Um, that's a good question. I, I, I'm guessing. I, I'm, there's no point in me guessing. Um, I, w I would guess it would, could, could well be a couple of days, two or three days within the body of a dead person that the virus could remain viable. But if there's an expert uh, pathologist watching, I'm more than happy to be corrected on that. But the, an the, answer, the, the practical answer is that, that we have to be very careful with dead bodies because the virus could still come out of their mouth. So, for example, if people are brought into hospital and they're dead, um, we, we call those dead on arrivals or brought in deads, then what we'll sometimes do is, because we're not sure how long they've been dead for, we'll do the old... Um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation and press on the chest and that's gonna that's gonna cause a huge amount of viral particles to be ejected out so the people doing that resuscitation will be at very high risk uh, in, in in the minutes after death and indeed perhaps for some hours after death if they were to do that um, of course there'd be no point doing it some hours after death you'd just be compressing the chest of a corpse um, but the, the answer is i would be careful for for some time after death and uh, th these patients would normally be, well, these ex-patients, these bodies, would be put into body bags so that there was no cross-contamination. So the, the safe answer is to assume that uh, the virus would be viable in a dead body for some days, if not for longer, would be the safe, pragmatic answer to that, I think. Good question, though. Right, uh, just trying to help. Interesting name. Just trying to help as a question. Um, South Korea never had a lockdown. So why they had relatively few deaths? Well, that is an excellent question. Now, it's not entirely true. There were restrictions on on the communications and things in South Korea. But you are right to say they did not have a complete lockdown like we have here. But what they had in South Korea was they had a huge amount of testing in a very, very early phase of the infection and were able to bring testing to bear at a very early stage. So they were able to test people and when they were positive, they could then isolate them for 14 days. And what they then did was they traced the contacts of those people and they isolated them for 14 days. So this is what they did. They did test, track, trace. So they tested people and then they traced their contacts and isolated their contacts. So it's like they had an infected person and by isolating all their contacts, it was like they created a firewall uh, around that person to stop further spread. So the answer is they stopped the infection virtually entirely by testing, tracing the, the contacts and then isolating the contacts. And that worked well in South Korea because the, the population understood what was required of them. And, and virtually entirely that they obeyed those instructions. So the compliance of the population there was remarkably important. But that's the answer. They did targeted testing, targeted contact tracing, very good quality contact tracing, followed up by isolation of contacts. So the virus died out and the chain of transmission was broken. So that is the answer. Oh, and of course, they wore masks from the very start of this, which I believe would, um, which I believe would reduce the transmission of the virus. Okay. Who felt like they had it and got diarrhea at the end? Okay, Brian. Yep. Um, now, th this virus in animals is actually a gastrointestinal virus and it can infect the gastrointestinal tract. So if someone has the if someone has COVID-19 and they're sick, then the vomit would be infectious. 
If someone has COVID-19 and they have diarrhea, then the diarrhea would be infectious. The stool would be uh, infected. So uh, gastrointestinal features can be a feature of the disease. They can come and go. And I can't quite remember the percentage, but there's a certain percentage of people get gastrointestinal features. Now, um, I think it's probably about 20 or so percent can get gastro, 20 or 30 percent can get gastrointestinal features. A very small minority, I think it's only about 3 percent, get exclusively gastrointestinal features. So the vast majority of people get the fever, uh, the dry cough and the anosmia, the, the, the lack of smell. That They're the three common features that most people get. But you're quite right to say that diarrhea uh, can be a, a symptom because the virus goes into the gastrointestinal tract. And of course, remember that the, the feces in the stool can be infectious. And this particularly matters if someone passes diarrhea or stool into the toilet. Then when you flush the toilet, the water comes down, then that can aerosolize the virus up into the air and it can contaminate surfaces and stay in the air for some time. So very important to put the lid down and cover the toilet when it's being flushed to reduce the amount of uh, virus that gets out. Uh, broxnol can homose can okay can homosexuals spread the virus right i think the question there really is if i'm reading between the lines is can this virus be spread sexually um now the answer to that question is that this virus is contacted through mucous membranes and of course, the, the, the genital surfaces are lined with mucous membranes. And there has certainly been positive cases of the virus from vaginal secretions uh, in the literature from China. So um, the virus, I suspect, could be spread sexually. Yes. If a person was infected, I suspect they could shed the virus sexually. I do believe that's the case. But apart from anything else, if you're in a sexual situation, then the proximity would mean you've got the risk of virus from the mouth anyway so i think it's probably true um but it's the probably the close proximity of a sexual encounter that would be the greater risk rather than the direct spread through the genital uh, mucous membranes but it's a legitimate question Okay, so this person here is asking, um, can you make a global update including Greece? Because cases start going up again. Yeah, so Greece was interesting. Um, the situation in Greece um, was actually very good at the start. Gre Greece did a very early uh, lockdown. And uh, their early measures were quite effective. Uh, quite infect <laughs> quite effective they worked well uh, but now people are worried about a second wave and this is the case all over Europe as the lockdown eases there is a risk of a second wave well not even a second wave because remember of course this virus hasn't gone away yet so it's still there so is there a risk of that yes absolutely there is this virus is not going anywhere until we have a vaccine or until we have herd immunity so wherever cases are currently going down, there is a risk of a second wave would be a fair principle on which to uh, operate. So could there be a second wave in Greece? Yes, absolutely. There could be a second wave in Greece, I'm afraid. Uh, DJ. DJ, uh, where, where's, where have they gone? Oh, DJ, what does it mean to be a super spreader? Okay. Now, you've probably heard this expression, R naught or the R value. And as you probably know by now, now the R value is the average number of people that any infected person will infect 
And for the coronavirus, it's probably about three if we don't take precautions against that. But of course, that's the average number. Some people will only shed very small amounts of virus, whereas other people spread very large amounts of virus. So for reasons that aren't well understood, some people shed a lot more virus than other people. So someone might be have the infection and just shed very small amounts of virus and be very unlikely to infect anyone. Other people might have the infection and spread huge amounts of virus. So the virus are just spewing out of them all the time, even when they're just breathing normally. And of course, those people are very much more likely to spread it to other people. So some people shed way more virus than others. And they're more likely to be super spreaders. <clears throat> now, if you combine that, especially if they don't care and they go out into crowds, or especially if they are in a work environment or if they're inside in public transport, <clears throat> then they are they have the behavioural opportunity to infect very more, many, many more people. So there's two parts to being a super spreader. One is that you are biologically prone to shed large, large amounts of the virus. And the second is that your behaviour brings you into contact with many more people. So it could be that one person becomes responsible for infecting hundreds. So there was that religious group, for example, in, in um, South Korea, where one person was infected and uh, attended this service, and they ended up infecting potentially hundreds of people So um, because they were indoors. So it's the combination of those things. Biologically, how much virus do they shed? And how much opportunity does their behaviour give that virus to spread to other people if you've got someone who's shedding a lot of virus who goes into a lot of crowded areas then you've got a super spreader and one person could infect 20 30 40 100 people potentially quite easily being above average being above the r naught average right uh this is behaviour. Can this virus be transmitted via water? Hmm. Good question. <clears throat> um, now, the virus has been isolated in sewage. But of course, sewage is heavily contaminated uh, with feces and urine. So that's not surprising. Um, and it would be at high concentrations. So if it's at high concentrations, the answer is yes, if, if the water is fecally contaminated by an infectious person. Now, if we're thinking about things like drinking water, then that usually goes through various cleaning systems. So we can say that drinking water is, to all intents and purposes, safe unless it's contaminated with sewage. I would have thought that's basically true. Uh, thinking about situations like swimming pools. Now, swimming pools have chlorine in them, and the chlorine will kill the virus really very quickly. So in swimming pool situations, unlikely uh, that it will spread in the water because the chlorine will kill it. But if you're in a swimming pool and you are inside, it's an indoor swimming pool, then you're breathing the virus out. And of course, people will get it through the air. So the risk in a swimming pool is more that people will catch it through the air rather than through the water. But in clean drinking water, I don't think there's anything you need to worry about there particularly. I'd be quite happy to. <clears throat> um, the domestic water supplies are usually, are usually uh, that's usually accounted for. So the question is, uh, theoretically, yes, if the water is heavily contaminated in practice, um, I don't know of any documented cases of spread from uh, from water. No. Right. Um, Palivia. What is the evidence based why Asian Indian has low mortality rate? Please clarify. Right. OK. Well, the answer to the question is that it's not true. Um, people from the Indian subcontinent in the UK, for example, 
have higher mortality than white people who live in the UK. This is part of the vitamin D uh, hypothesis that I've been putting forward. So um, to say that Asian people die less in the UK is not true. Now, Asian people, when you say Asian people in the States, you often mean people from Korea and Japan. Uh, there is some evidence that they may have a slightly lower case fatality rate, but that's not clear yet. Uh, now, as regards India itself as a country, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there's a lot of cases there now. And the cases are increasing really dramatically in India at the moment. And people are starting to get sick in India at the moment. Now, how many people are dying, we don't really know because a lot of people are dying without being tested. So the answer is we don't know. Um, so we don't know the true incidence of, of COVID-19 in India because India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, thinking about those countries particularly, because of very limited testing. So, so we don't know. Um, is there any reason why people in India or um, Pakistan, Bangladesh should die less frequently than people in the UK. Um, I can't think of one unless it's a younger, demogra younger demographic. But what would concern me about these countries is there's quite a lot of undiagnosed hypertension and certainly a lot of undiagnosed diabetes, which would tend to increase the, the case fatality rate. So um, I think the answer to your question is, um, the, the premise of the question is wrong and that we have no evidence that people in India are dying uh, less frequently than people in the UK. And we know that people, Indian people or Indian ethnicity people living in the UK die more frequently than people from uh, f people with white skin. And uh, part of the answer to that could be that uh, people from the Indian subcontinent produce vitamin D more slowly and also have more hypertension and diabetes so that they could be the risk factors. So uh, I don't think it's true to say that less of them are dying in terms of percentage, unfortunately. Um, QL, have you got any definitive information on the number of strains of the virus now? Are one strain more harmful than the others? OK, um, now... I suspect, I don't know the answer to your question, but I suspect that the, the people that study this are called phylogeneticists. And I think they've identified 100 or more strains of this virus that just differ from each other a little bit. Because, you know, the virus will come to England and it will mutate in one way. Then the virus will go to America and it will mutate in another way. But as we've said, those mutations don't seem to be significantly affecting how likely the virus is to cause disease and how likely the virus is to transmit so the answer to your question is probably hundreds of strains, but only very minor genetic changes. And those genetic changes do not seem to have affected how harmful the virus is. No. So uh, are one strain more harmful than the other? Then the answer at the moment is probably not. Would be the answer to that question. Uh, right okay i think i might have jumped a few here but um d is asking uh what do you make of the tanzanian president who tested a fruit pawpaw and it came back positive he sent it to the usa under the guise of a human Oh, OK, D. Um, I don't know about this story, but what you're saying is, I don't know, but the president of Tanzania um, sent a fruit to America to be tested. Is that what you're saying? It doesn't really make sense. Anyway, l l let's try and answer the question. So if someone, um, I think what we're really talking about is, is food being infected here. So if someone, um, for example, who has an infection coughs on an apple, then I eat that apple, I'm going to get the infection from that apple because the, the infection from the infected person will live on the food surface for a period of time. 
So raw food that's just been infected by someone else is a possible means of transmission. Cooking will, uh, cooking will kill the virus. So temperatures above about 50 degrees centigrade and certainly 60 degrees centigrade or 70 degrees, cent 70 degrees centigrade, what we normally cook at, will kill the virus. So cooking will, will, will kill it. Um, if the president of Tanzania, if, if this question is sort of implying, is there a fundamental problem with the way we test? Uh, then the answer is no. The, the, the PCR tests are a very good quality test. How about swimming pool and salt water? We've kind of answered that already, haven't we? Um, swimming pools and salt water. Well, swimming pools, we've talked about, the chlorine will kill the virus instantly. Uh, salt water, the virus doesn't like salt water either. So in the sea, I wouldn't be worried about going for a swim in the sea. Uh, the, the salt water is um, is going to kill the virus pretty quickly. Okay. So, uh, Jessica, uh, I'm not going to read that out, but um, basically it's it's one of these conspiracy theories. This one's related to Bill Gates, and uh, th there's now I don't I don't know Bill Gates. I never met him, but there's quite a few conspiracy theories around. Now let me give you a couple of examples. Um, the virus is not a virus, it's caused by 5G networks, it's just rubbish. Uh, one that killed quite a few people in Iran, drinking alcohol kills the virus, that's rubbish. So these conspiracy theories about the virus that are not based on science uh, are part of the reason I do this. I try, I try and work out what the evidence base is. And th there's two sorts of conspiracy theories. There's <clears throat> the sort that um, are kind of vaguely amusing and the sort that can actually do harm. So, you know, whatever the conspiracy theory is, if it's just vaguely amusing, but it's not true, then you're wasting time on it. If it's not true, but it's potentially dangerous, then it's potentially dangerous. So do try and make sure that any theory you are looking at is based on science, is what I would say. We need to go with the evidence. We need to go with science. Uh, just a couple more. We've been going for quite some time now. What's, what's that? Cigarette smoke. Question there from Lisa about cigarette smoke. Okay, let's think about that. Now, there's some evidence that nicotine is protective, but I don't know how good that evidence is. But there's clear evidence that current smokers get more severe disease when infected. So if you're currently smoking, I would strongly advise that you stop smoking as of now if you possibly can because we know that current smokers are more prone to infection and get more severe disease and as well as that like any other exhaled air as lisa says it will contain viral particles yeah so this is another thing um with air pollution air pollution makes infection worse because it's more if, the, if you're in polluted air what happens is someone will cough out the virus and the viral particles would get stuck to particles of air pollution, these microparticulates. And then the, these microparticulates are so small, they will just hang in the air and then people can breathe it in and become infected. And the more particles of air pollution have more of the virus on, the higher the viral infection dose someone will get and the sicker they are likely to get. So cigarette smoke is basically lots of these little particles of smoke and uh, that they could all be carrying virus. And like any other smoke, they are an increased risk of spreading the disease. Yes. So um, air pollution is a risk and cigarette smoke is certainly a form of air pollution.
Okay, uh, Peter. What is the value of oxygen concentration for home treatment? Well, some people who get sick with this virus, uh, like the Prime Minister Boris Johnson in my country, for example, I'm just looking for my oxygen meter in. Here we are. Um, so, so some people uh, who get this virus uh, get sick and they're unable to absorb oxygen as normal and supplementary oxygen for a few days could be life-saving. So the answer is, what is the value of an oxygen concentration concentrator for home treatment? Is The answer is that could be absolutely immensely useful if someone was short of oxygen. So if someone's short of oxygen as a result of the, the, the pneumonia in this condition, uh, if they get supplementary oxygen, they can keep their oxygen levels up and they might survive. If they don't get that supplementary oxygen, that means they might die. So oxygen is absolutely key here. So an oxygen concentrator could, could be potentially life-saving because it will give enhanced amounts of oxygen, yes. Uh, if there was no healthcare facilities available, that would be true. And the other thing I think is a good idea is that um, you can get these little machines now. These are about $20 each. And so we see that my heart rate is currently 71 beats per minute. 70 beats per minute. I'm settling down, 67 beats per minute. And we see that my oxygen concentration in my blood is 98% saturated. So my heart rate is about 69 and my oxygen saturations are about 98. Now, if, that, if the oxygen saturations went down to about 90, well, lo, below 94, I'd start thinking about it. If they went down below 90, I'd start getting a bit concerned. So then you might start giving supplementary oxygen. We normally like to keep oxygen saturations above 94, so mine's okay at the moment. So the, the, the answer is that if, if your oxygen levels are low, as detected by one of these machines, and you add some way of giving supplementary oxygen. It could be life-saving, yes. And and this is this is the part of the tragedy of, of this that um, people who don't have access to basic health care, like oxygen therapy, is the case fatality rate could rise really quite significantly. So lack of availability to to health care. Um, and it could just be very basic healthcare, like giving oxygen for a few days, can be life saving. And yet, if people don't have access to that basic healthcare, uh, as, as for example, we looked at in rural areas of Peru, uh, th then that could mean that they, they die from this infection and the case fatality rate can go up quite significantly. Um, uh, ASK, how many hours of sunlight do you? How many hours of sunlight to maintain good vitamin D levels? Well, that depends what your vitamin D levels are now. Now, if you've got a reasonable body exposure, so you get your shirt off and you've got your shorts on, and the sun is more than 45 degrees in the sky, the sun is high, it's high, more than 45 degrees in the sky. And you might remember I got this information from Matt, who's the, the doctor we talked to in Australia. Then... Um, if you get, suppose it takes, uh, suppose it's a sunny day and it takes two hours to get sunburned. So you don't want to get sunburned. But if, you've, if you're having exposure to your, your top, if your top's off and you've got shorts on or a bikini top on or whatever, then in half the time it takes to get sunburned, you should make about 20,000 units of vitamin D is the answer. Now, if you've been exposed to the sun regularly and your vitamin D is already topped up, of course, that's going to be loads. But if you've been exposed to a, an English winter, for example, and your vitamin D levels are fairly low, then you'd have to do that for quite a few days to get topped up. But that's roughly the answer. So a good overall body dose with, with a good surface area of the skin. So I'm not just talking about the face and the hands being exposed. But, you know, get, get your kit off and get, get some area exposed to the sun. In half the time it takes you to get sunburned, if the sun's more than 45 degrees in the sky, you'll make about 20,000 units is the answer to that. And we probably need about 2,000 units a day. Probably.
kind of hard to be definite. Okay, I think we're getting near the end. I'll maybe take one more question from uh, one or two more questions, then we're about done. Um, how long we've we been going for now? Oh, it's nearly two hours. Heck, yeah. Although we did have a break, didn't we, with a technical error? <laughs> now, now, um, Lisa, Lisa, lovely. Uh, what's the most accurate test here in the UK, please? Swabs or what? Right. So when you take the swabs from the nasopharynx the back of the nose or the back of the mouth, then those swabs are detecting for the presence of the antigen, which is the virus. That's the antigen test. Now, the gold standard way to test those is the polymerase chain reaction test, and that is very accurate. But it can give false negatives. In other words, you can say someone doesn't have the infection when they do have the infection because the swab didn't pick, enough, pick up enough of the, didn't pick up the virus, it happened to miss it. So if you've got a good quality swab in someone with a, a good viral load, th th then that test is remarkably accurate. And the other form of test is the antibody test. And the antibody test is testing for the immune proteins that the body made in response to exposure to the virus. And the accuracy of those varies very much depending on the test. So, for example, we in the UK ordered about 3 million of those from the Chinese, the antibody tests, way, way back in about February. Now, if we got those and they'd been good quality tests, that would have revolutionised our understanding of the pandemic in the UK. But they didn't work. They were only 70% effective, so we sent them back. I do hope we got our money back. I never heard if we got our money back or not. But the newer tests, the new antibody tests that are coming out are much more reliable. So soon we'll have a reliable... Uh, um, a reliable antibody test and in Kenya they were developing uh, an antigen test from the breath which would be brilliant so you just like breathing in and out of a breathalyzer machine and that would tell you about the virus or not but I haven't heard that they've perfected that yet so it would be good but th the answer to the question is the basic swab PCR test is highly accurate if that virus is there it will show it up that, that's the accuracy of the, the PCR testing. Okay, I'm going to do one more question and that will take us up to almost two hours. So I think that's that will take us up to two hours. So I think that's quite enough for both of us. Surprisingly tiring doing this, isn't it? It's like teaching, you know, when you're teaching classes, it is actually quite hard work. You know, I, I've been working as a staff nurse for the last few years and, you know, I can do maybe an eight hour shift. And at the end of an eight hour shift, you're about as tired mentally as I am after two or three hours teaching. It's actually sort of constant uh, concentration. Um, okay. Heidi. Are herbal supplements, etc., beneficial? What do you think about immunoboosting or immunomodulating supplements? Is it risky or helpful? Now, herbal medicine, of course, is just a completely fascinating field. Now, when we give drugs, when I give drugs at work, so suppose I want to give someone 10 milligrams of morphine, for example, which I do quite often, um, or I did up till last year, did it quite often, it's a common thing. Um, the preparation I've got, I know I'm, I'm given, given the exact amount, because it, it's made by clever pharmacists and pharmaceutical companies. But if I give someone for, some opium sap from an opium poppy, I'm not quite sure how much is in it, because it's kind of the herbal version of it. So um, it's hard to get the dose accurately with, with, with herbs, because they vary, it varies from plant to plant. Um, and as well as that, Having said that, I mean, with, with herbal preparations, that can be good because you can have different substances that interact in positive ways. So it can be good, but it's, it's hard to get the evidence for it because of the inconsistency. So at the moment, there is no hard evidence that I'm aware of 
that any uh, substance is going to help against COVID-19, uh, apart from perhaps uh, rem remdesivir, which is shown to have some advantage. Um, now, immune boosting, you talk about immune boosting. Uh, I don't believe there's such a thing as immune boosting. So your immune system's there, right? That's how well it's working. Now, there's no drug you can get to say to your immune system, right, work harder now because it's already working brilliantly. But if you're deficient of things, that can make it work less efficiently. So if that's a healthy immune system, deficiency will make it work less efficiently, but giving supplements will not make it work more efficiently. That's my understanding. So the answer to your question is, are, are herbal supplements beneficial? Unless you're deficient of something, I would say there's no evidence for that at the moment. Uh, are they immunomodulating? Well, we know vitamin D is immunomodulating, but I don't know of other molecules that are immunomodulating. But if they are, it would be better to concentrate them in, in, in a, in, as the pure molecule, then we'd know exactly, exactly how much we were giving. Right, this is going to be the very last question now. As we're over, it was on two hours now. It was a question there about... Yeah, there we go. Um, Sweden has not yet reached the top infection cases yet. Yeah, so I have been following Sweden. Now, let's just take this to a general principle. Um, what, what you're saying is I, th I think the antibody studies have shown that about 10% of people in Stockholm have been infected by this virus very rough figures and um, in the UK it may be slightly less so let, let's say in Stockholm it was that 10% let's say it's 15% I'm not sure let's suppose it was 15% of people have been exposed to the virus therefore have some form of immunity but we need 70 or 80% to have herd immunity so that means we're just at the start of this pandemic and, and, and maybe leave that as the takeaway message. Sweden's at the start of this pandemic. The UK is at the start of this pandemic. The United States is at the start of this pandemic. The whole world is at the start of this pandemic because it's not going to be over until 70 or 80 percent of the population are immune. So I'm getting really bored of this now. You're getting bored of it. People on demonstrations are choosing to basically ignore it. But we are at the start of the pandemic. That means more people that the virus is going to keep on spreading. The World Health Organization tells us about 80% of people that get infected have a mild illness. About 15% have a more serious illness and about 5% have a critical illness. And that's going to carry on until we have a vaccine or till herd immunity develops. So we are actually just at the start of this pandemic. Unfortunately, this has got a long way to go yet. OK, well, I wonder if anyone stayed on for the full two hours. If you have, you have my absolute admiration because we've done two hours now. That, that's that's enough, I think. So um, thank you very much for watching. Do remember we are still near the start of this. It's got a long way to go. So this new normal, I'm afraid, must persist for some period of time with our social distancing and the isolation with people that are sick and the isolation of the contacts of people that are sick. We are unfortunately still pretty near the start of this pandemic. So um, we'll see what the feedback's like from this live chat, or well, two hours of it. <laughs> um, and uh, what I've already promised I'll do is I, I promised to do a live chat that's more suitable for people in places like uh, California and the, the east coast uh, sorry the west coast of the United States <laughs> uh, and uh, more suitable for their time zone so we'll do we'll do that in a few days time at a time that's good for you and we also want to do one that's more suitable for people in, in Australia as well so we'll do that and we will see how it goes and I really do appreciate you watching it's it's really kind of you uh, so thank you for watching and uh, we will talk again soon. God bless you all.